My topic is uh, like uh, uh, that, like with both of my predecessors is uh, on this panel, is the what what I like to call the trade development nexus. All right, the, this very intimate and close connection that we have between international trade on the one hand and economic growth and development on the other. And our remit uh, for this uh, for this conference is to look at. Uh, developments over the last uh, 30 years, uh, the 30 years of WIDO's existence from 1985 to, 20 <clears throat> to 2015. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, within this very limited time span that we have, is to look at the last 30 years in the light of uh, some theoretical concepts that uh, uh, were developed around uh, this trade development nexus. Well, one uh, strand of the literature has, uh, with, uh, with which many people, uh, several people connected with wider, uh, uh, including myself, have been associated is what, what we've called north-south models. Right? That is, you look at the world economy as being divided into an industrialized and developed north and a, you know, a less uh, primary, basically primary producing or uh, 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 or to some extent, labor-intensive manufacturing producing south, right? Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, the difference from traditional trade theory is that we didn't think of the two sets of countries as just being country A and country B, which have just different proportions of endowments and so on, but as being sort of asymmetrical, all right, in their operation. And the way I like to look at it is to think of the North as a neoclassical solo economy, fully employed uh, with a, <clears throat> with a built-in uh, rate of productivity growth that provides the engine of growth for the world economy. Whereas the South is a Lewis economy, a dual economy. Uh, there's a peasant hinterland, uh, which we may call the, tra the traditional sector, or perhaps also containing services and so on, and uh, what Lewis called the modern sector, uh, producing either <clears throat> you know, plantation products or manufactured goods or, or, or whatever. So uh, in the north-south models that I developed and uh, you know, other, people <clears throat> other people have developed, the idea has been <clears throat> to look at the interplay of the solo economy and the Lewis economy through the terms of trade and how this affects the rate of growth and so on of the, not only of the world economy, but each of the, each of the two uh, <clears throat> components of the world economy, the North and the South. So if we take this North-South approach to the current situation, what can we say? What's happened in the North? Well, in the North-South model, the North sort of happily ticks along at the solo growth rate, right? The, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the rate of population growth uh, plus the labor augmenting technical progress uh, that is the driving force of the world economy. Uh, now, what's happened since then? If we, look over, if we look at the last 30 years, that does not give us uh, the... the uh, the best uh, way of looking at developments in the North. Uh, when I was a student, uh, when I first started studying economics in the early 1950s, there was an exciting concept uh, advanced by, by Alvin Hansen of Harvard uh, called the stec Secular Stagnation Thesis. So I, I was very entranced by that, and then the whole concept of secular stagnation disappeared from economics, because everybody thought that, well, you know, Keynes has uh, ended secular stagnation, because if you're short of full employment, you just, you know, you do expansionary fiscal policy or monetary policy, and you, you get rid of it. All right, but we know it's not so easy, and for and it, to my to my to my big surprise, the idea of secular stagnation has uh, is being revived. All right, so we see that uh, there seems to be a tendency, in, you know, in the advanced economies, uh, for the full employment level of uh, aggregate demand uh, to be difficult to be maintained, and fiscal policy has mm, not been uh, able to do much because of the austerity, you know, the, the, the fashion of austerity, the spread of no, uh, notions of austerity. Monetary policy has driven interest rates down to zero, but even that hasn't been uh, sufficient to uh, maintain uh, the demand at the high level. So we've got this slowing down of the engine of growth provided by the North, right? 
So not only, <coughs> not only uh, these deficiencies of aggregate demand, but also there seems to be a slowdown in the rate of productivity growth itself. Uh, perhaps not in the long run, perhaps not in invention, but in the sense of the application of inventions to actual production. So the northern engine seems to be beating more slowly. Uh, if we look on the Lewis side of the picture, well, China we could think of as a, as a vast uh, Lewis economy, for example. Uh, and uh, one of the things in China has been uh, Chinese economists have uh, talked about, some of them even in wider research papers. Uh, one of the things they've talked about is, has China reached the Lewisian turning point, right? And uh, the view was largely that maybe by 2010, this uh, uh, you know, rapid development with relatively flat unskilled wages is coming to an end, unskilled wages are going up, and then obviously all the skills, more highly skilled wages are also rising in turn. And then if we look at the factor price frontier, the inverse relationship between the wage rate and the rate of profit, we see the rate of profit coming down. If the rate of profit comes down, then growth rate slows by the standard Lewis formula, and as a result, uh, growth in China is also slackening. So the, so the North-South framework applied to 1985-2015 enables us to see that both poles of the North-South uh, North model are functioning at below, at uh, somewhat below capacity. So the outlook uh, at this global macro level uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, for the moment, at least something uh, that uh, causes quite a bit of concern. Now, uh, we can all, in the trade development uh, literature, uh, it's not only the sort of macro, global, general equilibrium picture that we need to look at, but we can look at, this, we can look at the world economy from the standpoint of a single developing economy. If we do that, we can, you know, for the most part, we can use the small open economy framework where the economy faces given world prices, maybe a given interest, world interest rate, and uh, if you allow for a risk premium, that, that determines the internal interest rate, all right? So what about the situation of particular economies? Well, I, all, uh, econ here economies can choose. I mean, you know, they can choose to have protectionism, import substitution, all of those things. I, you know, we've, we've exhausted that subject in this morning. I, know, I wouldn't say exhausted, but you know, we, we've, we've beaten it pretty hard. Uh, this morning, so there's no point in the very limited time I have uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to repeat uh, <clears throat> uh, to repeat that. All right, but uh, every economy has the option, right? As uh, I think Adrian said, you can, or, or no, maybe it was Alan, that you can just, you know, at a stroke of a pen, you can sort of dispense with these things, and then you can, let's say, you can. Uh, uh, approach the, 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 the world economy as an opportunity. So supposing you do that, then what can happen? Well, this morning we heard from Justin uh, about his new structural economics. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the disadvantages of being as old as I am is that whenever one hears something new, D.H. Robertson wrote about it, you say, well, uh, this, maybe it's not so new. I mean, you know, this, uh, I've, I've come across this thing before, right? And in this case, uh, I, I came across it before in 1970. I wrote a paper called Factor Proportions and Comparative Advantage in the Long Run, where I said that, you know, if you're a de developing country, you've got a very low capital labor ratio. Advanced countries have high capital labor ratios, but you can't just imitate the uh, advanced country because if you try to do that, every, you, your cost will be too high. So what you've got to do is, you know, accumulate, raise your capital labor ratio, and climb the ladder of comparative advantage, all right? So one analytical way in which I illustrated this was the concept of the billion dollar production function, right? So think of how can you produce a billion dollars at world prices of a number of goods, okay? So you can have a hierarchy of goods, very labor intensive goods at one end, very highly capital intensive goods at the other end. And you can, for each of these isoquants can be for $1 billion worth of a good. If you draw the envelope to all of these isoquants, we can call that the billion dollar foreign exchange production function, right? The country can, by Picking one point there, you can, you can generate a billion dollars of income at world prices. So which point should you pick? 
uh, efficiency says you'll get the best result if you pick the point that is appropriate to your capital labor ratio, right? If you pick that, maybe that's very labor intensive, like Korea and so on in 1960, you produce shoes and wigs and things like that. But then if you save and accumulate a la solo, then you, you, your capital labor ratio will rise and you will ascend over time to increasingly, you'll climb the ladder of comparative advantage, you'll get to increasingly capital intensive, you'll start to export increasingly sophisticated goods. So that option is, remains open to any single economy, all right? So the fact that uh, the world economy as a whole is slowing down should not be a reason why any single uh, country cannot take advantage of this process of climbing the ladder of comparative advantage. Uh, on the other hand, I want to say something uh, about the role of the state and infrastructure. I've been working on this con on infrastructure with my colleagues uh, Stan Wellish and Rich, Rich Clarida for some time. And the way we think of infrastructure is the following. I think of a production function, right? It's a Cobb Douglas production function. Normally in, in, in front of that production function, we put a coefficient, let's say just A, which is a constant, right? But make A, A should be not just a constant in our, in our opinion, but a function of the level of public services that the economy provides, uh, what can be called hard and soft infrastructure, right? This is the law and order, because for the economy to function properly, you have to have a process of law and order, you have to have the borders defended, you have to have law courts, you have to have all of those things, you have to have properly functioning roads, road and transport, properly functioning public utilities, things like that, okay? So the better, this, the better the quantity and quality of this infrastructure, the more productive the different sectors of the economy can be. Now in the spirit of Arthur Lewis, we can think of two sectors, the high-tech sector and the low-tech sector, and we can, uh, Clarida and I assume that infrastructure has a differential impact on these two sectors. It has a stronger effect on the high-tech sector. And then we can assume that the high-tech sector and the government and infrastructure uses, the sk uses skilled labor in a very simple two, two kinds of labor model. And the low-tech sector uses unskilled labor. Let's say capital, both sectors use capital, but you can import capital from the rest of the world at the world interest rate plus a risk premium, okay? So that ties down one factor price. And then the model uh, that I, I don't have time to construct and show you, but which can be done, will determine the skill wage and the unskilled wage. Now, if you determine the skill wage and unskilled wage, you get the wage differential. And if you have an exogenous cost of education, the ratio of these two things will give us what Becker and Mincer call the rate of return on investment in human capital, all right? So infrastructure can, by boosting productivity, particularly in the skill sector, can raise the skill wage that raises the wage differential, that creates a more incentive for the rate of return on education to grow so you can build up the skilled labor force, you can accumulate more skilled labor force over time. So we can think of a model in which, you know, the government has a very important role to play, but this isn't like industrial policy or socialism or central planning or anything. As a matter of fact, it fits into what Adam Smith called the duties of the sovereign, right? Provide the framework of law and order and institutions and physical uh, public goods that make it possible for the private sector to function, to function effectively. Uh, and if you do that, then you widen these wage differentials. That has, uh, of course, at the beginning, a negative impact on income distribution, as Adrian would, uh, would, would be quick to point out. But at the same time, it gives the incentive for the, labor, for the raw labor force to accumulate skills over time and then ev and eventually to catch up. So that is a very benign process, right? So one can put together in this framework, you can put together infrastructure, formation of human capital, international capital mobility, and of course, openness to world markets, okay? Now, uh, if you go through all the countries in the world that, uh, you know, every, every country has this, opportunity, has this opportunity. The one who's taken the opportunity best, in my opinion, is Singapore, all right? And Singapore, Singapore has all these things. It provides infrastructure at a, you know, at, at a very, very high level. Its, it's, it's uh, educational system, you know, pours out increasingly skilled labor force. It's very open to, internet, to importing capital from abroad. And the result is, uh, is, uh, is a very good one, right? Now, many, uh, 
my friend uh, Deepak Naya, who's sitting in front of me, has uh, rightly points out that you know we should be aware that cases are different and so on. But when when Deng Xiaoping was looking for a model. Uh, what was his model? His model was Singapore, right? And you say, this is crazy. I mean, Singapore is a tiny city state. All right, there must, there must be 200 cities in China that are bigger than Singapore, not to speak of the whole, you know, the one, 1.2 billion or whatever the total population is. But basically, that's what China has done. I mean, it's put in a lot of infrastructure, right? It's brought in foreign investment. It's opened itself up to the world. It has, you know, producing increasingly skilled labor force. And these are, these are important components of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of development, okay? So although every country is different and so on, which I, of course, uh, completely understand, nevertheless, I think, you know, the importance of infrastructure, importance of skill formation, importance of upgrading your industrial production, uh, structure, all of these things, everybody has to do, all right? So there's, the, there's this common underlying element that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that we have. All right, so uh, I think that uh, you know one always used to hear sometimes in the in that if the you know if the if there was a, a recession in the West that you know everybody that 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 the the third world or the developing countries should immediately sort of look inward and sort of try to escape from this situation, but. You know, I, I think that's, uh, that's wrong. I think the important thing is to continue to take advantage of the world economy. And if you do that, uh, and if enough people do that, then I think you can actually uh, change the world. Uh, thank you.